Okay, I mean, we're gonna get started kind of almost sort of on time. And I think I'm gonna go first so that I can kind of get myself out of the way. Um, but I did prepare a whole slideshow and thought about stuff. So maybe I'm just gonna do the thing. Uh, do I need to introduce myself again? Ben Weehy from the um, MIT Museum and manager of the Science Social Alliance, manager of experimental practice I'm here with Haley and Jessica who are amazing. You all know who they are now. Uh, <laughs> you know, Haley. And we're not <laughs> we're not on Zoom now, right? Is that correct? We are, we are on Zoom. Ah, okay. Then so behave. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. Um, I don't know how to handle questions from Zoom or interact with Zoom. Okay. Okay. So especially for those on Zoom, um, we'll try to remember to take even breaks. Um, maybe we'll stop between our talk and see if there's anything particularly from Zoom. But anybody in the room here, just shout out if there's something that um, you don't understand, or you can even say one of my favorite comments I heard at a science event recently, you're losing us. <laughs> so um, I this is gonna kind of rehash some of what you just heard. I, so I'll move quickly through it. This what do public science events look like thing. I'm used to, um, whoa, I, I'm not doing that, right? But I would like to move the slide. Can I get the clicker to? Uh, there it goes. Oh, okay. So um, there's one way to answer this question, right? Is what what does the public science event looks like look like? I feel like we're uh, that is a helpful th thing to bring into this conversation. Um, is there anything you already had a chance to look at this slide? Is there anything that like popped out at any of you? It's like what? Parlor. What's that? Tattoo parlor immediately. Yeah. That's not does that does that surprise? Does is there anybody? <laughs> Is there anybody here who's like tattoo parlor? Obviously. Okay, we got one who's there. Yeah, the first time, not the only, that I was with a tattoo parlor um, is uh, Carl Zimmer just produced this amazing book of science tattoos of people who've gotten tattoos that are science related and their stories. And so we had uh, the Carl Zimmer presenting that book at a tattoo parlor in San Francisco. And way oversubscribed, including to the point where I had to run the door um, just as a volunteer to like kind of just manage this demand. Uh, and there's people who are like, I drove four hours for this. I've got this. He needs to see it. And I need to be it's like, right, okay, okay, we're managing the demand. So wildly, overwhelmingly successful tattoo parlor. Um, what's, how is that a scientific event? How's that, a, what's that have to do with science? I don't, anybody, does this just seem like it doesn't have to do with science at all? Except that like everybody who was there had a tattoo that was inspired in some way by some scientific thing that was really meaningful to them so much so that they put it on themselves permanently. And if you talk to one of them, they would be so enthusiastic about the fact that they wanted to share that thing with you. And you learned a lot about science just from the people who were there. Some of whom were like, you know, scientists. And many of whom were like, this is, I read about this once and it's so meaningful to me and I've always carried it with me. And so I put it on wherever I put it. Um, okay, I, we can keep, I want to keep moving fast, but you, you're you really interested. You're, you're interested in the site. What's that? The sex shop one? That's the one that you're interested in? So not, again, not the old. Because <laughs> there's a whole line of, this could be a whole line for your career. I mean, it could be like one where I can be moving. I've been to several sex shops as part of science, but I haven't organized it myself. This is me visiting uh, festivals, and other things going on that um, having a sexologist or a biologist um, in connection with a local store owner, um, Again, wildly oversubscribed events because they're just really, really odd intersections. And you normally don't think of like, wait, we're going to do something serious in one of those places. Well, actually, some of those places are very serious about what they do and have an enormous fan base and know how to work with their customers and how to draw their customers in. Again, like science can happen there. All right. Um, and then these settings, 
Um, we can, I, I want to move quickly because I want to make sure there's, is there anything that somebody, you don't have to pick something out of there if there's something like, what are you talking about? Okay, so the science community thing. I'm typically in a room when I'm like wearing a jacket or something and clicking a PowerPoint slide, I'm typically in a room that's on that science side. And it's filled with people who are being either pushing or being pushed by that arrow. Um, and they're typically institutionally based, right? Or institutionalized, I could say. They're, you know, from universities or museums or, um, uh, you know, from the halls of power that, that claim to own science. And those uh, organizations and those people all have these missions to make sure that the world knows all about it. And that's what it often looks like. And so my conversations that I typically have are things like, um, oh, I've heard of science festivals. I want to start a science festival. I'm like, great. So um, that's interesting. I'm glad you heard about them. Um, what kind of festivals do you go to in your area? And the answer that typically comes back to me is, although there isn't one in my area, that's why I want to start a science festival. I'm like, no, I said, what festivals are in your area? And we're talking about, so some of you are not on this side. Some of you are on the community side. But so, for those of you on the science side, you have awareness that, what comes first is that festival idea. Like you can't have a great science festival if you don't know what a great festival looks like. Okay, on the community side, you nope. Oh, wait a minute, that's better. On the community side, we have these main streets, folks. I'm just gonna lump you in right now as community side. Hello, well, you're here at this meeting, so I don't know where you fit anymore. And I hope you're feeling a little uneasy about that too. Um, on the community side, when I go to the Main Street's um, Main Street America conference, and I say, and they say, "Oh, what do you do?" I'm like, "Oh, I run the Science Festival Alliance thing." Are you, you know, this, oh, maybe we could run a science festival, but we wouldn't know how to do that. I'm like, well, what festivals are in your area? And the reply immediately comes back. Well, we have the food festival. We have the car festival. We have this beer brewing festival. We have, and like, yeah, well, you, those are, you, that science and science and also science. Um, and they already know, of course, what it is to run a festival because that's what it is to have a vibrant community in a welcoming, alive Main Street. So um, we're in a unique, this, I love this little mix right now. And both of you can learn from each other. Um, if there's anybody at all, I've heard just little inklings of it from the Main Street side that's a little bit like, well, there's a scientific authority and we can't question that. You're legit too. So that, that's the message to you. On the other side, the science side, know that they're legit. <laughs> know that event organizing is a craft and that you, we have to, that means we have to take that, the, those concerns seriously. All right, so what happens when they get closer and they explode in this event? Um, I've seen things, which where happens after that explosion? I've seen events that are oppressive to people. And I don't know if any of you can, I see some nodding that they're not necessarily oppressive to everybody that goes. They're not even necessarily oppressive to people who went, but they might be oppressive to people who definitely elected not to go. So I can, we can talk about that more. Oppressive to volunteers and their staff. Yeah, 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 okay. So we could explore that further if we want to. It, they can be exclusive. They can definitely be exclusive in a whole wide range of ways. This can be about systemic racism. It can also just be about like, well, those nerds are having fun, but obviously science isn't for me. We can talk about any of these things more if you like, but I'm gonna move, try to move quick. They just can be like, well, the science just took the community in a bad place. It was boring, annoying, hard, and just plain not fun can be completely irrelevant. The science is just like, well, we did this event and the science got communicated. And the community was like, was that even, what even was that? I've seen these things, these dynamics, sometimes all in one event. It, it's not all bad. There could be like this reaction on the community side, well, oh, it's really, really important that we do this for the kids. Which is like, oh, but, you know, but what about us too? So, I mean, there's this, 
utopia in my mind where an event can eventually become something where the reaction is that we're moving together toward, uh, towards like the, with this healthy relationship and we're oriented in the same way, almost aligned would be the, the word. And, and we're feeling like this science is something we can all take part in. And it's part of what makes us all who we are as a, individuals and as a community. And um, I don't remember why I put this slide up because now I'm just blanking. It's supposed to be, oh yeah, to say like, well, so we have these negative things that could happen. We have these amazing, incredible things that could happen. Obviously that requires intent. It requires taking things seriously. So how do we know how to control what's coming out of this explosion? But for those that actually witnessed the eclipse, yes, yes, the ones that didn't think much of it and want to do anything, but they all come around to clean that. The eclipse is an amazing, uh, I'm sorry to cut you off. I think where you're going is the eclipse is an amazing universal human experience. And it may or may not relate to science whatsoever it, as you experience it. And so I, it's very hard for me to imagine somebody being, having like a full spectacular total solar eclipse experience and being like, yeah, whatever, that wasn't for me. I, you know, I felt depressed by that sun and that moon. But the way that science is represented and acted out through the way that the event is, the event is created around that can send those messages and can send those messages via the V science. So um, the, the other thing that I'm trying to do here is move us towards all of us thinking in, this long, in a little longer term way, which I, you know, I, I just making room in this meeting for it because the eclipses are getting close. That this that you're along for a ride here that doesn't stop on on April eighth, and so hopefully you're going to be continuing to do this throughout your life because you're going to have been transformed by the experience if you've never done it before, or because it just like you know continues to fill your passion for doing this sort of work. And if that sort of work is connecting science and community through live events, uh, over time, you know, you can get lucky. Uh, and it sure helps to have a total solar eclipse. You only have something like that uh, in your back pocket, so to speak. Uh, and so a little bit of intentionality sure helps to keep from these negative uh, impacts to a minim minimum and um, let's start moving more in that healthy relationship side. These are the four things that I picked. I think I want to, I just don't want to move fast without like overwhelming you all with words. Usually my slides are all pictures. I usually don't do words. Um, I've already kind of explained this. It's the same as for any other craft. If you're a good um, science painter, um, then you better be a good painter first. Um, that may mean you have to adjust your priorities and your methods. Um, this idea of the medium events being a shared social experience. People bring their whole body to real places to do things with strangers. This is very important. This is stupid as it sounds. It's like, yeah, they do. But I, I recently had a bumper sticker made that said the internet is not a place and it just really fired some people up. They don't like that, but it's not a place. It's not a place that exists. Uh, people don't, you know, people aren't born on the internet. They don't bleed on the internet, not for real. And in places carry that history and that places that are where things happen is where meaning stays. So attending to intangibles like the mood, the energy and tone of event is really essential. Some of you already really know that, but for those on the science side, I'm always trying to say that because it's like, well, what information was conveyed? Are they able to, do a pop quiz at the end of this. I was like, well, that doesn't matter. It's what matters most is did this did the mood and the energy and the tone reinforce people's idea of who they are or and their shared identity, which is what events are really good at. That's what events do. Um, 
event organizing is community organizing. Nice little slogan that I love. Events have happened since the dawn of agriculture, so on and so forth, nearly universal human practice. There's a few things that flow from that. There are many points of inspiration for anybody start who's looking at how they should do an event. Um, those could be recombined in a lot of different ways to create new things. The expectations of your audiences, though, are going to be informed by their experience of their experiences with events generally. So somebody coming to say a science festival, somebody uh, is going to be coming to a science festival thinking of that as like, well, how, you know, I, ex I know what I expect from festivals, from all the, from that food festival is that, and from that music festival is that. So even though you might think that you're doing something different, your audiences don't see it that way. Some things that flow from that. Um, skilled organizers know what to do with all this. I just wrote a little screw, screed here for anybody who's an event organizer, and I'm just going to read it out loud because it might make you feel better, like they're, you're, you're known and seen. Events are incredibly flexible, and every iteration is unique, yet they also come with immense pressure to juggle many moving pieces on an unforgiving timeline and always have many variables beyond an organizer's control. So, um, event organizers get that and i've seen um hundreds of people at a time bond over that shared experience which feels like so many times like nobody else sees so be nice to event organizers <laughs> <laughs> and they and be respectful because they know things they're not just a flash of the pan um a lightweight way to explore new relationships that might live on. Um, best way to build relationships with somebody you want involved in your event is to go to theirs. And over time, I've seen these things become, some things that people have started become traditions that shift the culture of a community. What does that have to do with an eclipse? I mean, the eclipse is just gonna happen. This is a flash in the pan. It's just gonna happen this one little stretch of the US. Sorry, little, you know, I'm not trying to, 30 million people. And then it's gone, right? So then we're done. Mm. Or, no, well, does that not seem right? I mean, so what, what are you strategically building right now through that? That's gonna be great for your community. That's gonna be great for, you know, the larger institutions that you're beholden to or want to support. And how's it gonna be great for you? What are you gonna do with the relationships that you've built? And what are you gonna kinda, of, I don't wanna to put too much pressure on you all. I mean, April 8th is all you see, that's fine. That's very normal. But what kind of, what, what are you gonna do next? You don't have to have an answer for that. You can let that be emergent. You can let that like come out from wherever it does over time, but it really helps to be thinking right now, like, oh, I'm building, I'm building something much bigger. I'm building something that's gonna continue. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. And also there's another thing I didn't write down here, but um, nobody ever, knows all the impacts of an event. Mm -hmm. So, you know, event organizers know that and just have to sit with it. It's like, yeah, well, we probably inspired somebody and changed their life, but we'll never know. <laughs> so directly involve scientists whenever possible. We can talk about this more. Again, I'm, I'm trying to, like, move, I find myself slowing down. I want to move because there's real knowledge over to my left. Um, Every festival, every science event, every time I've seen a scientist interacting with the public, even when they're naturals and they're great, they appreciate having somebody else who's ready to take the reins, who's ready to say like, you know, say like, okay, that's it. And thank you so much. And thank you for coming. That's a perfect note to end on. 
or like, you know, Mr. So-and-so is very busy today and we're going to move him on to the next one. And, uh, you know, I, I can give you uh, so many different examples. Cambridge Science Festival is happening right now. I went to, uh, I was volunteering at a, multi a variety of events this, over this past week. Um, one event set up uh, was outside. It was absolutely astounding. The MIT Spatial Sound Lab had set up this um, sound field that when you're in it, it just surrounded you and boggled your mind. And if you're outside of it, then I mean like this, it sounded cool. It was kind of neat. But when you went like in, into there, it's like, whoa, what? And they were um, really capable of what they were doing. They're really friendly. They're really good at talking to people. Great ambassadors. The whole thing was a wonderful, you know, wonderful setup. I got there and I was like, oh, I don't have anything to do. I have to just let this go. And then after five minutes, I was like, there's people walking by. They don't even understand what's happening. So, you know, having somebody looking out for the overall thing and the overall experience of the, of the audience is essential. Um, so always involve a scientist whenever you possibly can. Don't be scared of that. But um, always have somebody else there who can take the, the power of the event and like steer it in the right direction for the audience. Um, this is just a little tip that like when recruiting individual scientists, it can be really awkward to be like, hey, do you think that you might be the right person for this really key role? And they're and the worst thing they could do is say no, or maybe the worst thing they could do is say yes. So uh, if you know, if you can find a way to ask people who that know that person before you ask that person whether they're a good fit, that's the way to go. Um, you can be transformed. Uh, you have complete freedom to go anywhere, do anything with an event. You can work with whoever you want to, whoever you need to, to best connect with a particular audience. Um, if you're institutionally based, especially on the science side, um, there's freedom there uh, because the answer for why you need to do a certain thing is because that collaborator said that's the way it should work. And um, the real key there, though, is to make sure that you're trying to bring your institution along a little bit so that you're adapting, they can see, your institution can see how you're adapting your mission to new venues, to new social settings, and new cultural contexts. All right, there's some uh, URLs. Um, they're all kind of under construction, um, but that experimentalpractice.org has, is the link to remember that goes to all of them. Um, uh, I won't sell them anymore because I want to get out of the way for you guys. All right, thank you, thank you. So if you have, oh, I want, I guess, if Zoom has questions, um, let me know. What, and we can do that while we're switching. All right, now what you came to. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there is a question in the Zoom from Laurel Ratto. Ben, one thought about what you are going to do after April 8th, 2024, the 250th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence is July 4th, 2026. Have any involved in the planning of the eclipse been asked to become involved in that event? <laughs> uh, the answer is yes, I, but um, I think more to come. That is, yeah, a major next step. I mean, we got to get through a presidential election as well. Mm -hmm. Well, thank, thank you to the Zoom cloud for that suggestion. All right. Is this one on? Yeah, it is. Okay, while she's getting that slideshow up, let's ask a question. How many people in the room right now have seen a total solar eclipse, like in person? Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. There's so many of y'all that have it. It's like knowing that you haven't read Harry Potter and you're going to get to read it for the first time. I'm so excited for you. Um, first of all, y'all were all in the first little pitch session where I ratted Haley out for her behavior. Um, that's her husband, Wes Isbell. Wave, Wes. 
everybody, Wes wasn't here for the first session, so he, you know, look at him. So if we have questions for specifically how you black out some solar lights in your downtown area because you want darkness, he's here. <laughs> Beside him is my husband. I love you. Please don't leave me. Y'all, <clears throat> the two minutes and 37 seconds of the total eclipse in Sweetwater, Tennessee were the best two minutes and 37 seconds of my life. <laughs> They were amazing. So those of you that haven't been there and haven't seen a total eclipse, you're going to love it. Like we read stories about people crying in the streets and we were making fun of them for a year and a half while we planned this thing. And what did we do? We cried in the, we street. cried in the street. <laughs> <And we're laughs> totally after did. that, we cried yeah. every time we thought about it. Yeah. It was such an emotional experience. And like it's been said so many times today, it is very unifying. It is one thing that brings people together and for the better. I mean, we all need a little bit more of that in this day and time, right? Just like Ben was saying, it's something that can unify yes. um, a community. So they will come. I can't tell y'all how many times we've done this presentation for communities that don't think anybody's going to come to them. How many of y'all are having that struggle right now in your community? Yeah, You're we not get alone. it. You're not alone. We get it. We were super confident. We were like, oh no, they're coming. USA Today published an article and put us on the front page in Sweetwater, Tennessee. Now, y'all, when would we normally be on the cover of USA Today? Like a mass shooting or something. It would have to be something horrible. It would be terrible news. It would be a terrorist attack. It'd be something super negative for us to be on the cover of USA Today. We're on the cover of USA Today, and they say, there may be 100,000 people come to this small town. <laughs> That's when we started panicking. We didn't have 100,000 people, thank God. But they're going to come. And if you're in the path people, of totality, they're coming. And our people said, would call us up leading up to the eclipse and be like, can y'all not just move that event to another time? I mean, that's a terrible day. It's a Monday. Why would you do it on a Monday? Yeah. They Sorry, really, we can't do that. They give us a lot of credit. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so this is our approximate attendance countywide. It was around 50,000 people. We do have a national forest inside Monroe County, Tennessee. A lot of people the and I will tell you, the forestry service did not prepare. I think at the last second, they tried to find some porta potties and we'd already rented them all. So they did not prepare and they were overwhelmed. The city adjacent to us came to the very first planning meeting that we hosted. They had not prepared anything and they had a bad experience. They had vendors demanding refunds. They had people that were angry because, but I will re rest assured for a second, if they can see the eclipse, they're going to be okay. They're going to be happy. They just want a place to be. And they just want to know for sure they can get to that place and have a place and see it. <clears throat> we already told you 50 states, 39 countries. Haley, kick us off with some branding. So yeah, to start your planning, and a lot of you may have already done this, and I know some of you haven't, but the, one of the first things that we did was media involvement. We went directly to um, the local news station, one of the local news stations in Knoxville, and we actually said, we want you on board to help us promote this, and it was a great partnership. Um, we heard earlier about how important it is to do pitches and all that. We didn't really have any of that information when we started planning our eclipse, so hearing it here has been awesome. Um, but you can see uh, WBIR Channel 10 in the photo up there on site the day of the eclipse. They were with us from day one of us contacting them. And every month we did a spot with them where they talked about what's happening now, what are things that you can expect. Um, and that spot was different every time. We were on a game show one time. When, one time our local dance studio taught people on air how to do the moonwalk. So there were multiple things that happened in, you know, preparing for the eclipse and promoting Sweetwater. Um, we put our logo on everything. Y'all saw our shirts earlier. I blacked out for two minutes and 37 seconds in Sweetwater, Tennessee. And we said that many, many times um, the year leading up to the eclipse. And listen, the social media that you all have available now is so much better than what we had when we were playing. We had Facebook Live. We didn't have Instagram, we did not have TikTok, we didn't have Reels, we didn't have Boomerangs, we had Facebook Live. And we literally, like one day, Jessica and I, you know, you're going to get a lot of questions and the best thing you can do is educate the public early and often about all of your plans. And you're going to, no matter what you do, you're going to have people say, oh, I didn't know anything about this. You can't do anything about that. Um, but jump on it early, put your logo on everything, glasses, t-shirts, water bottle stickers or laptop stickers. Um, 
put it on whatever you can. Haley made the mistake of saying, I love to ship t-shirts. I'll take that job on. And we pre-sold our t-shirts, put them on a website. They could buy them probably three or four months ahead of time. We sold thousands of t-shirts over and over. We just kept reordering t-shirts. The day of the festival, we had run out of t-shirts. We had bought so many and sold them all. And people were offering us $200 for the t-shirts. Off our back. Why we did we not sell them? I don't know why we didn't sell them. I don't know why we didn't sell them either. <laughs> I would sell them now. <laughs> um, Okay. Partnerships. You've heard that a lot today. It's so true. Partnerships make a big deal. We have a railroad that runs right through our downtown. So we had to partner with the railroad. Does anybody else have a railroad? Are they the hardest group on earth to partner with? Okay. Yeah. Ours is terrible. What, Brent, what state are you in? Arkansas. God bless Arkansas. Oh my goodness. We're jealous of you. Too. Yeah. Uh, we had a rough time partner. This is my buddy at the railroad right there. That was the most I saw him smile that day. And I was so excited when I got that out of him. He was not happy, but he was my hero because I had been calling the railroad for a year before this event saying, listen, there's going to be a ton of people in town. They're visitors. They're not familiar with this area. We need cooperation from the railroad. Can you please stop the trains that day? We talked him into putting, taking school out. We didn't have school that day because our eclipse, our totality was at 2.30 in the afternoon. It would have been a terrible time trying to get buses through town. Like it was impossible. So schools closed. So I was trying to work that same magic with the railroad. They were like, uh, ma'am, we don't stop the railroad for God himself. We are not stopping the railroad. That man came down here and he parked his Norfolk Southern vehicle on our railroad tracks. And we did not have a train come through town that day. I don't know why. I don't know where he came from, but he was a hero. Anyhow, as many partnerships as you can. Like I said, a year ahead of time, we were meeting with neighboring cities. This wasn't a competition. There was more than enough people to for everybody to have some. So we partnered with neighboring communities. We partnered with our county um, safety agencies. Really important you have safety agencies on board. Res rescue squad, Red, Red Cross, someone to offer uh, first aid. All of our employees were on deck. Um, we had them do tourniquet training to where if there was some kind of event that even the guy that works in the street department that doesn't have any medical knowledge, he could at least tie a tourniquet on somebody. So we did lots of safety preparation on the front end. That's the scary part. And thank God we didn't need it, but mm -hmm. schools and colleges, science related organizations. But yeah. What about that? Um, okay. Diversity and language barriers. This is the most diverse crowd you're ever going to have in your community. Like I said, we had 36 countries in 50 States. The, uh, they're all here for a common purpose. When does that ever happen? It's so cool. It's such a neat thing for your community. Um, we had alien enthusiasts. We had star Wars enthusiasts. Our totality was two minutes and 37 seconds, and it happened around 2.37 in the afternoon. So we had people who were numerologists come, groups of numerologists, because they thought there was some significance to the way those numbers lined up. We had a coven of Wiccans come and stay in the Lost Sea, which is America's largest underground cave in Sweetwater, Tennessee, the sweetest street in Tennessee. And... They came and stayed there under, under the earth during the eclipse. They did not want to see the eclipse. So they came and stayed underground in the lost sea, which was strange, but yeah. Um, so just really different people. Um, and like we already told you about Haley, just do whatever it takes. Do what it takes. You can see our logo in that picture also that was stenciled all throughout our downtown area. So again, wherever you can stick your logo, put it. Um, We've already talked about utility and street lots. Y'all know all about me now. So three kids later, she got those street lights turned off. So the point about that is <laughs> your rural communities are a treasure for an eclipse. You want it to be as dark as possible when the lights go off. I mean, when the, when totality happens and it gets dark, if there's, we found out there was a bar downtown that had a neon light yeah. from 40 years ago, and you could, man, those videos and stuff that are still on our YouTube page, if you want to look at it, you can see that bar's neon light from like a mile away. But do you all see that picture back there with the tower and everything, this beautiful picture? That city, you can't make it dark. You know what I mean? Those lights are all going to be on during the day. So if you're in a rural community, if you have a rural location, that is not a negative. That is a positive for an eclipse. Um, here's some of our pro tips. Parking. Some man from New York called us a year ahead of time and said, um, I just want to reserve a parking spot. Will you sell me a parking spot there at City Hall that I can sit? I said, yes, sir, we will. 
and fifty dollars later he had a reserved parking spot and then about a thousand people later we had made a lot of money off selling parking spots we rented a piece of farmland out near the interstate and sectioned it off into parking spots and sold parking spots for fifty dollars a spot and had some college kids work that parking lot over the weekend and people paid because they just wanted a spot to come to we would let them pay over paypal and then we would send them an electronic parking pass. And that's how they knew they put it in their windshield. They drove into the parking spot. They sat there and watched totality. Then they hop right back on the interstate and left. Um, accommodations. Some of you all probably struggle with not having enough hotel rooms. We have seven hotels. We have maybe three hotels that we would be willing to tell somebody to stay in. So Haley, what did we do about accommodations? So, I mean, honestly, and this will be different no matter what your community or you know where your community is but a lot of our residents turn their homes into airbnbs during eclipse time we had people that had farmland that turned it into campsites um so it was really a lot of people coming together to make sure that there was enough accommodations for the people that were coming because like we said they're going to come whether you're prepared or not so it's better to be prepared for you know the influx of people than to just pretend like it's not happening and try to move it to a different day like so many people wanted us to do. And then we did a map, which was something that we could hand out to people and also a digital map that we could put online for, you know, where the accommodations were. And it was kind of like a pay to play thing. If you wanted your home or your land to be on the map, you had to pay us and then we would put it on the map and, you know, advertise that. We put that out on our Facebook page and pretty much um, everywhere we can. The news um, would the talk website, about that as yeah. well. Yeah, on our website, we did have a website for the Eclipse. Um, so really, you know, that was the only way that we could make that happen with our other three hotels that we were like, yeah, you might want to stay here. Yeah. One warning sign for all those people. We you don't put them on your pay to play map. Don't list them. Don't don't sponsor them, for lack of a better word, unless you know they have a toilet, <laughs> like enough working toilets. Um, and you know, some kind of space, the, the capacity to handle this. But so many cool stories came out of that. Like people that opened their home as an Airbnb just for this one event, they still talk to these people today. Like they still are in communication with them. And there are some really beautiful stories that came out of it. Okay, photographers. We talked a lot about this in that last session, but mm -hmm. we basically, we had a fenced in outdoor pool that's only open two or three months out of the year. It had already closed by the time our eclipse happened. So we set the photographers up there. They paid us $25 and we got to keep their photos. They had to send us a digital copy of their photos afterwards. They were allowed to put their watermarks on it if they wanted to. We were happy to give them photo credit, but by God, we were going to use them however we wanted to. So that was the agreement we made with the photographers. Yeah. They were, they were so happy to be with other photographing geeks. You know what I mean? Like they were all happy to be together with a common interest. They were sharing each other's equipment and like showing each other what, what aspect they were going to put their camera on. And like, they were so happy to be in their own little community together. Um, we didn't force them to go there, but that was their opportunity. If they wanted to make sure there was no toddler wandering around beneath that $25,000 lens that they have for photography. Um, we had six engagements that we know of during the eclipse. So when we were talking about earlier about sharing the story, the human part of this, people know this is going to be a momentous occasion. So they get engaged during the eclipse. You got some cute wedding shop downtown. My God, tie it in, have them do get engaged during the eclipse. Come no, no, no. We'll help you do your promposal or whatever it is. Um, we had one couple get engaged on the roof of city hall. And it is not glamorous y'all. It is like, yeah, it is like, it was built in 1979. So think about that architecture. But they did. They it's got ugly. engaged on the roof of City Hall. And we helped arrange for them to get up there, which is not an easy feat. I'll just tell you that. Mm -hmm. um, but they were very appreciative. And, you know, I think they were on the news, too. They were on the news afterwards. So that was another way. Yeah. As Ben said, it doesn't end on April 8th. It's yeah. stuff that keeps feeding your community. It's six years later. Me and Haley are in San Antonio, Texas, talking about the eclipse from six years ago. Exactly. It's totally exactly. transformed us, Ben. Yes. Um, the stamps. Okay. The post office last time, the U.S. post office, did a solar eclipse stamp. Haley, tell them about it. It was um, thermal. Like you put your thumb over it and it changed into the moon. Was that right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And so they released this stamp um for the 2017 eclipse our local post office did a cancellation stamp on site the day of our eclipse so you can see that in the picture and that is our postcard that we sold with our, our blacked out low, uh, tagline on it 
So the day of the eclipse, people could come to, you know, the post office booth at our festival and get that uh, cancellation step. And it was a one day cancellation step only. So it was really cool. And again, that's the beauty of small and rural and mm -hmm. um, is, you know, those kind of partnerships you may not get outside, you know, in a big city. Maybe you will, but. Okay. Totality is amazing. These are three shots from Sweetwater, from our professional photographers that were up there. There is a time-lapse video. It's not embedded in this presentation. So I'm just going to tell you where you can find it. Our YouTube channel at City of Sweetwater, Tennessee government. I'll put a slide up at the end that has that on there. And then you'll also get it in the PDF from all this. But there's a really cool time-lapse video that shows you how it went down and like the crowd standing around downtown and stuff like that. Um, this is also a video on our YouTube page, which I'm not going to show, but this There's is that neon sign. Yeah. Do you see that neon sign? Do you see how Haley did all this hard work to get those lights off? And Wes, Wes did a lot of hard work too. And that one neon sign, you can still see it. So here, learn from our mistakes, figure out a way. Now, we did talk to all of our vendors because we had a three-day festival. We or four, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. That is four days. Yeah. I told y'all we were the dumbest people in the room. Okay. So four-day festival and... um. We told them during, when those vendors were set up during totality, you're not allowed to sell. You have to turn off all your lights. We don't want to hear a cash register ding. We want it quiet and dark during totality. Um, and we like threatened them. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had a totality countdown clock. So obviously we had a web based clock that counted down until totality. But then we had one sitting on the gazebo in the middle of downtown to tell them when totality was coming. And then when totality started, we had that clock reset for two minutes and 37 seconds. Here's what I will say. And I, I almost started not to say this because the photographer said something slightly different. So, you know, here's my suggestion. You decide which way you want to go. We wanted people to be present in the moment of totality. We wanted them to experience it. We did not want them sitting there with their iPhone like this because an iPhone does not take good pictures of an eclipse. Now you can probably buy stuff that he would know way more about. So if you really wanna do it, talk to the photographer guy, figure out what kind of equipment you need. For us, we reiterated to everyone over and over, this is why we're getting those photos from the photographers is so they can share those photos. They know what they're doing. They've got the equipment for it. Let's use their photos to remember this day. You just stand there and be present during totality. So that was another reason we had the countdown clock is we had someone at the gazebo saying, a minute and a half left of totality. And then every 30 seconds, he'd say one minute left totality. And that way people didn't have to be checking their watch or anything. They could just stay in there and experience it. Yeah, we totally agree with that. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Right. Yeah, that was and the other was thing, cool. safety. We would say, yeah. okay, put your glasses back on, you know, with two seconds to go or whatever to make sure everybody knew when to put their glasses on. And in. to talk about earlier with the meteorologist when he was up here, it was the the news station that we were partnered with meteorologist is who did the countdown for us. Mm -hmm. So that was cool because, you know, we didn't have to really worry about making sure it was accurate. He was handling that. But yeah, that's that's a good point. So Haley, tell them about uh, traffic when leaving. There's a video on our Facebook page about this too. Well, and we touched on this earlier, but, you know, the morning of we're like, nobody's coming. Where is everybody? Our community's going to hate us. We're going to have to move like nobody's going to want to talk to us ever again. But um, traffic leaving was the problem for us. And it wasn't so much of a problem that like people. Hated we didn't us. have one accident. There was not one yeah. single accident. But literally, and there is a video on our Facebook page of us talking probably deliriously after the eclipse. And you can see the traffic lined up for miles on Highway 11. Um, in our town. So that will be the issue is when people, when it's over, people will leave. Most people will not want to hang out and attend any more festival act activities or go back to their hotel. 
um, unless they're getting on a plane the next day or, you know, it, it messes with their travel. But people that are traveling, you know, in the area, they're going to want to leave as soon as it's over. The so, group that's pushing the Tuesday stay, I think that's a brilliant idea. Yes. And I think you should push it as hard as you can. Mm -hmm. Don't be surprised if they just leave after totality. We were told that ahead of time. We were like, no, we're going to have dancing in the streets right after totality. It's going to make everybody stay. Nobody stayed. No, they all they left. Yeah. <laughs> but it was still great. Um, the Okay inform the locals. We did reverse 911 calling to everybody that lived in Sweetwater. And we said, please stay home. Mm -hmm. If you have prescriptions and groceries that you need before this weekend, go the Thursday before. Do not wait until Monday and try and get through Sweetwater on Monday. You're not going to get through. And they did. They did. They've and never listened close. to us in their lives or since, <laughs> but they did when they, for whatever reason that day they did. Our schools did close. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So check with your county government or whoever runs your dispatch mm -hmm. for your police and fire. Typically, they have a reverse 911 system. Um, they may say it's for emergencies only, and that is possibly their policy. You can tell them and make the argument this could turn into an emergency real quick if people <laughs> get out on the road when they shouldn't. But it's a great resource. Almost every 911 in the country has it now. And, you know, ambulances get into our hospital. We have a hospital in Sweetwater. So there had to be alternate routes for ambulances to travel that day um, because of the road closures and some of the, you know, the traffic and stuff like that. So, you the know, dialysis said, clinics. Yeah, that was one of the best ass chewings I got was from the dialysis <laughs> clinic because they were like, we have to go to dialysis. We can't not have dialysis this day. Not no. in Sweetwater. Not for us. Not in Sweetwater. Now we prayed a long time about this event and I quit cussing for like three months and I'm pretty sure that's why we didn't have any ambulance calls, but um, we didn't, we didn't have any. Now I think countywide there were more. That was an excellent segue into safety, partnering with as many safety organizations as you can. For us, Knoxville and Chattanooga were not in the path of totality. So they knew everybody, nobody was going to be in Knoxville and Chattanooga that day. They were all driving to Sweetwater because we told them it was the sweetest place to watch the eclipse <laughs> from. So they all came to us instead. So Knoxville came down. They put their eye in the sky for us. They helped with security. Like those other communities came to us and helped us when we reached out and thing. Everybody's oh. on the Do you have anybody in the other direction? Like the ones that are going to be, I don't know, I guess it's going this way this time. So this way. Mm -hmm. And even like we had volunteer fire departments come in, people that aren't under our jurisdiction that we can't force to come help us. They still have a lot. We pulled a lot of people in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a valid concern. And we did have, like I said, we had tourniquet training. We also had AEDs down there in case we needed it. We had rescue squad down there. We had volunteer fire, which all of our firemen are first responders. So that helped. We pulled in other first responders that happened to be around that day and made them come. Um, but safety is a real problem. We had some guy walking our railroad tracks up and down like two months before this festival and our police chief freaked out. <laughs> he was like, who is looking at these railroad lines? And then we found out he was from I don't want to say, I don't know. I think it was Yugoslavia. And so we were like, that feels weird. So we had snipers on the rooftops. I mean, we had a lot of safety preparations that we never told anybody about that. Thank God we didn't have to use. Right. Um, communication equipment. You can, I don't know who your main provider is here, but I know Verizon and AT&T both have extra towers that they can bring in. Your emergency services people probably have access to FirstNet on AT&T, which allows them to request an extra cell phone tower be brought in. Sometimes just your organization, like we had a backup radio system because we didn't know if cell phones were going to work with that much draw on our rural towers. So we had radios, like old fashioned police radios that we were calling each other on. And we assigned them to the key volunteers and to each, you know, people at different staff. We had a communication center set up out on Highway 68, which is completely away from all the downtown activities to make sure that if they needed to be able to reroute traffic or tell somebody where to go for an emergency, they could do that and have access to that. Um, 
prepare for some lovable weirdos. But I will tell y'all, this is the cleanest crowd we've ever had. We thought we were going to spend hours after totality picking up trash. I don't think there was one single piece of trash. There wasn't much. I mean, they were the cleanest, yeah. nicest, most grateful really group. Nice. It was hard to go back to other festivals after we'd done this one, <laughs> yeah. I'm telling you, because they went back to being the same people they always were. I loved your be nice to event yeah. organizers. I love I'm that being so true. Mm. Oh, so for <laughs> kids, there's so many different things you can do for kids to help them get excited about the eclipse. Um, safety was a big thing for us. Uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of people coming into your town and kids can get away from you in the snap of a finger. So one of the things that we tried to educate people on uh, prior to our eclipse is where do your kids go? Where's your lost kids station? And we had a check-in at our, um, it's called a duck park. It's where, yes, there's ducks there, but it's where our kids zone entrance was. So they would get an armband and on that armband, we would write the phone number of their parent or guardian who was with them that day. And then we had a space shuttle on top of our gazebo downtown where all the countdown and all that was happening. And we told the, the parent and the child, you know, that's where you go. Look for that space shuttle. And that's where you go if you're lost. And that's where you can be reunited with your parent or your guardian. So um, safety was a big thing for us with kids. It's also a fun opportunity to educate them. You can see in these pictures up here, um, our library did pinhole projectors um, with our kids. They were great. They were super involved in the eclipse. Um, we had an art camp probably, what was it, a two-week art camp in the summer, and the kids did the mural that they're standing in front of. Um, it's a replica of Starry Night, Van Gogh's Starry Night, and it has points of interest of Sweetwater on it, so they helped paint that, and that was set up downtown the day of our eclipse. People stood in line for hours to get their picture made in front of this mural that they painted, so um and then the moon rocks that you can see in the picture. That was a big thing at the time um, in our area is hiding rocks around town. So the kids painted moon rocks in art camp and they hit them all over town. And that's something that we advertised. You know, if you bring your kids, look for the moon rocks. So just a lot of fun um, projects with kids. Oh, mm -hmm. keep going. How to benefit your Main Street program. So if you're a Main Street program in here, um, this is a great opportunity to engage your business owners. One of the things that we had our business owners do was decorate their windows and the local news station came down and like judged the window contest. So all the businesses had like, you know, eclipse themed windows. Um, some of them had shirts, t-shirts that they sold. They, um, it was just a fun way to get them involved in this, you know, because their businesses were right in the middle of our festival. Um, it's great for fundraising opportunities. I think Jessica may touch on that in a minute. Pipeline development, the news article, the news article that's up here. Um, these two ladies that are in the article, they actually met during the eclipse. One of them is a coffee shop owner and the other one was a bakery owner. They formed a partnership and opened a business. So the day of the eclipse, the uh, coffee shop lady was set up in just a vacant um, storefront that we had on Main Street selling cosmic freezes, which is like a frozen hot chocolate. Adorable. It was delicious. And from that, they developed a partnership and they opened a business and the coffee shop is still um, in business today. Um, it's a great opportunity to build your vendor base as well, um, whether it be for other festivals or just getting yourself out there, getting your name out there, putting yourself on the map, because for a Main Street community and for us, you know, local is such a, anytime that you have an opportunity to promote your community um, and something that people will come back to or planting that seed, you might benefit from that years later. Like Jessica's mentioned, here we are, you know, all this time later, still promoting Sweetwater all over the place. So um, it's a great opportunity to benefit your Main Street program, engage your business owners and create things that will, you know, last forever. So fundraising opportunities, we sold t-shirts, we sold postcards, we sold, sold parking spaces, $90,000 is what we sold. So we invested that back into our downtown area. Um, we also won some tourism exposure, um, some tourism awards, lots of press. We had lasting capital improvements. We dedicated a clock downtown. We repaved a downtown parking lot. We purchased from the railroad, my buddy that was smiling all the time. <laughs> we purchased a property from him and began to lease it out as an um, open air market and food truck park. Um, and we had a reclipse. This is the reclipse. So one year after our eclipse date, still going a year later. We told everybody that had come to the Eclipse in Sweetwater, we posted on the Facebook page, send us your pictures in your t-shirts, tell you, tell us where you are, 
shout out, whatever. This is our favorite picture. They are in Rome in front of the Coliseum in their Sweetwater, Tennessee eclipse shirt. So we love that picture. We uh, buried a time capsule that day, dedicated the clock and just kind of talked about everything that had happened since then. So it was a great event. This is our still active Facebook page. Again, this will be in the PDF that you all will get. Uh, the YouTube page is still active. You can look at the favorites playlist and see those two videos that are in here. Um, our, our website, unfortunately, is not active anymore because we didn't want to keep paying a domain name fee. So we kept it active for like a year and then kind of let it go. Um, these are the resources we used. Um, you guys actually literally heard from these people sitting at the table today, the people that we were trying to find online and get resources from. Um, that's Kate Russo's Eclipse Planning Guide there at the bottom. And there's our contact information. If you have people in your community that are not excited about the eclipse and you need somebody to talk some sense into them, me and Haley are happy to We're do that for you. Because you. guess what? <laughs> I can say things to your community that you can't say to your community because they'll get mad at you for saying it. I don't care if they're mad at me. I'm never going to see them again. So we are happy to talk to them. We're happy to do a Zoom video for y'all. Um, if there's any questions, we'll take them. But I think we're, we've almost ran out of time. Questions? Okay. Yeah, we have a couple of Zoom questions. Yeah, I was going to read those. Uh, we have two questions from Laurel. Uh, how did Sweetwater Main Street program build off of the eclipse in the subsequent years? Any events, new members, et cetera? Okay, we did do that economic evaluation to say, okay, here's the $90,000. Here's what we re reinvested it in. We presented that at a city board meeting. We talked about it on the Facebook page afterwards and did videos of that, which you can still see those. Um, and uh, we're here talking to you all. <laughs> We've talked to New York and Boston and Indiana, um, Arkansas. We're going to Indiana again next week. So, um, you know, I, I, I will never, like Ben said, I will never be able to measure the impact that the eclipse had on our community. We've had businesses come out of it. And I promise you, everybody that lives in Sweetwater is like, oh my God, that was such a great day. Yeah. I, I mean, there's a little bit of a dream of mine that some of you all, after running an eclipse event, um, find that you want to keep doing this sort of thing. You, whether it's tied to a reclipse celebration or not, but uh, you know, continue to celebrate science in your communities, um, you know, for the foreseeable future. Uh, her second question is: Do you have any suggestions on how to get people to stay? Does she mean after? You think she means stay after? Yeah, that's the thing. I think, I think she can get them to stay. I just think it's going to be before. It's on a Monday. They might take off the Friday before even and do travel Friday, be there Saturday, Sunday, Monday, which is kind of what we banked on and do our festival for. I think it'd be a real hard push to get them to say Tuesday, but I'm so excited to hear some of y'all are doing that. And I want to know how it turns out if it works. And one other thing, um, porta potties, that's a real thing. Y'all jump on that early. We got all the porta potties we could possibly get our hands on and everybody around us was mad at us because we took them all. And then we bought a year's worth of toilet paper with uh, at the beginning of our fiscal year so that we would have enough toilet paper for, you know, to replenish that stash throughout that festival period and the eclipse. So um, that's not in our slides, but it's been mentioned multiple times today. Wes. Wes is bull. Can you say anything about how you turn the street lights off? Yeah, you, you would take them off. And luckily, our downtown area wasn't isn't very long, so it didn't take our crews a lot of time to do it. We could get it done, a couple trucks within about an hour, hour and a half. I would imagine for an event like this that any local utility would be would be able to to put forth effort to to try to make whatever they can happen. We're we're pretty lucky that that our utility was able to work with the city to do this. And if not, we'll send Haley out to your utility district too. We, we had one last Zoom question uh uh from Joanna Johnston, who do we contact at AT&T for a tower? Great question. If Okay, 
So I'm not sure where, who, what kind of entity Joanna works for. Obviously we're a city, so we have an account with AT&T that gives us priority. It's a FirstNet account. She needs to figure out if maybe her police or fire station have a FirstNet account, if her community, her county, her city, her province, whatever it is, if they already have FirstNet, you can just go on their website and request that uh, special unit to be brought in to give you more cell phone reception and more cell phone coverage. Shy of doing that, I would check with a 911 center because communications typically has the ability to request those extra. You could probably request it just as a Main Street director or whoever else, but more than likely, if it's somebody that already has that FirstNet account with AT&T, you can just request it online really, really easily. We had a question. Um, I just do real quick. Uh, when you have a flood, you still can have a house. We're opening that time capsule at my funeral. That's what they said. <laughs> I've already decided. No, I think we said 50 years. 50 years. Haley, what all we put in there? Uh, we put some of our merchandise, some of the uh, media, like the press articles. Um, our logoed stuff, some photos, photographs. Gosh, I'm trying to remember what all we. Put I know in. we put a T-shirt in there. Yeah, it'll probably be mildewed and gone. By the time. <laughs> so and we buried it right under our visitor center. So, yeah. so a lot of it was related to our event articles and materials. We bought a time capsule yeah. from like Amazon or something. Like it's a yeah. thing. You can go yeah. find it online. Hopefully, it still will be there in 50 years. And we, you know, we had photographers contacting us mm -hmm. honestly. And once we figured out what we were going to do with photographers, and we put that information out there, you know, we sold that spot until we felt like we didn't have enough room for you know to accommodate. And we probably had 20 professional photographers, I would yeah. think, total. So it wasn't a super overbooked area. Like we, they had a little space to effort. maneuver. Mm -hmm. yeah, sure. Thank you guys. Everybody, I think we need to wrap up. Thank you to Haley and Jeff. That was so much, so much information.